Rowland. I'm a researcher at Curtin University Sustainability Policy Institute, or CUSP, um, and I will be your MC or facilitator for the night. Um, yes, we have two fantastic speakers. We've got the um, world-renowned expert around renewable energy, Professor Peter Drogi, um, and we have Ben Rose from, from SEN. Um, we'll spend the first um, probably about 40 minutes. Um, Peter will, Professor Drogi will be giving um, a talk, and then that will be followed by a short presentation from Ben, who will be looking at um, some of the modelling they've done for the uh, for phasing out coal in the Swiss. Peter Drogi was last here. He actually spoke in Fremantle about seven years ago, eight years ago, when we had a, um, a seminar on the renewable city which was held in the Carnegie Way facility out here in North Fremantle. So he's come back to North Fremantle. But the interesting thing at that point was that wave power was just a really a nice little idea, a bit crazy. <laughs> and here we are, we're now looking across at Garden Island now and it's completely powered by wave power. And they're uh, now established as a, a firm that's getting contracts around the world. Things change pretty quickly with renewable energy, and um, Peter has been one of the people at the forefront of this. Now, I've been telling him since he got here that we're doing all kinds of amazing things here now in Western Australia in, in renewable energy. And then it was kind of interesting to find that the uh, today, the uh, Liberal Party put out a a big wrap around, a big full page ad and so on. Labor's 50% renewable energy target. Blackouts like South Australia, higher power bills, higher household fees. Odd but true. Labor leader Mark McGowan repeated almost word for word Julia Gillard's ill-fated carbon tax line when he said yesterday, there will be no renewable energy target at the state level under a government I lead. So we haven't progressed a long way, have we? <laughs> um, <laughs> It's still, you know, a highly political thing. And Peter's in a part of the world where renewable energy has been a bipartisan, not highly political issue, just get on with it type issue. And in Germany and Denmark and so on, and he's been in the thick of all that. And the University of Liechtenstein, it's Liechtenstein Institute for Strategic Development, actually that's based in the building. Berlin and in Liechtenstein. And, in and uh, he's been uh, working on these issues, particularly about regions, which is why we thought it was relevant tonight, because Co Collie is a classic example of a place that needs to have a future, not based on coal. And the same, in, in many ways, it's uh, symbolic of the whole state. And that move is part of a journey. And you'd have to say Europe is a long way further down that journey than we are. So we're very pleased to welcome Peter. Uh, we're going to record this and put it on every social media device that ever existed to get it out there because the mainstream media, media uh, seem to be at that kind of level and not much better. Peter Drogi. Thank you very much. Those of you that had the great pleasure to watch this exciting theater of preparing the stage for you today, <laughs> we're witnessing not just a technological feat, but part of a global revolution. A uh, technological revolution which surpasses the last great industrial revolution of the late 18th century. It wouldn't feel like that being here today, but it is actually part of a global change. A structural change, which is stronger and larger than any other industrial change we experienced in the, in the 20th and so far the 21st century. It is marked by one great difference from the other changes we've seen in the auto industry, in the steel industry, and so forth, which have to do with globalization. This uh, transformation, which is fundamentally both internal, intrinsic to, to the technology of energy, but also intrinsic to the change that we have to embrace as a species to survive. This is the first revolution which we have to plan. All the other revolutions happened due to the innate change of civilizations, of cultures, of technologies, 
of demographic shifts. This is the first and perhaps the last test of our intelligence. And so it couldn't be a better place than here in Western Australia to do that because it is probably one of the most innovative and exciting places to be in at the forefront of this revolution. And if, the, if there wasn't a counter-revolution, it wouldn't be a revolution. So this, in this kind of seeming chaos, there's extraordinary opportunities. And that's the message I'd like to bring today. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. This is a map of all the brown coal and black coal resources, major fields around the world where this same change that we find here in Western Australia, in Central Europe, in the United States, in Africa, in Asia, experience. <coughs> this is a map of Germany, what is the largest coal-fired power plants. And I'd like to take you on a small journey to one of those stage sets where, in fact, Europe is one of Europe's largest coal-fired power plants here at the Polish border, just a bit south of Berlin. It's a three gigawatt coal-fired power plant. More capacity than it requires to power the entire state of Western Australia in one power plant. It has its own brown coal resources. And that's the focus of our planning exercise, which I'd like to briefly share with you, not as a message to anyone particular for a particular town, but really as a way of perhaps beginning a discussion an exchange on shared challenges and shared destinies. This is the mm, electricity mix of Germany. A quarter is renewable, wind, biomass, photovoltaics, water power. A quarter is brown coal. A quarter is 20% is black coal. About 15, 18% nuclear. And there is natural gas in that mix. And what that also shows is the trading of the electricity with the neighbors of Germany and Europe. This is also an interesting map, a different way of looking at the energy footprint of Europe. It's a map that shows the health costs due to coal-fired uh, electricity. You see a hot spot there in the Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria, but followed by Greece and Turkey. Followed by the other European countries, you see that uh, Spain, Germany, Finland, and so forth are relatively, relatively low cost, but still high and very significant health costs due to the air pollution and other pollutants that act on the national health costs. There are many ways of describing this great discourse. What I'm trying to say is it's a cultural, a, a cultural change as much as an energy technological change we're witnessing. This is the coal mine I'm describing. This is background of our stage set, the brown coal uh, mine of uh, Brandenburg, one of the large mines south of Berlin. In the distance, that uh, power plant. You see the nine cooling tower. Power plant, six blocks of 500 megawatts capacity each. Um, the cooling is being provided by groundwater that's being drained from the region to expose the brown coal, a perfect system. <laughs> so it's like a gigantic hair dryer that has been running 24 hours to dry the entire region. Uh, an ingenious masterpiece of former East German technology. There it is in the snow, quite pretty. There is without the snow, not so pretty. It's owned, it has been owned rec until recently by the Swedish government. A company called Vattenfall, Waterfall, pretty name. Um, the Swedish government sold that thing in order to clean up their carbon balance. Uh, and because nuclear doesn't count so much in the carbon balance, Sweden looks much better now. They sold it to a Czech entrepreneur. Here you see the field, there you see the, the, that massive, one of those massive fields of Brandenburg. Open, cut. There is the power plant, conveniently located. Small town of Pints to the north. Slightly larger town of Cottbus. 100,000 inhabitants. And if you look at this picture embedded into your mind, the next picture is Collie. 
the same scale. And it's a, a lot of interesting uh, parallels you can encounter here. But it, I've spent entire evenings just looking at these two pictures. But the most interesting thing is, of course, that the footprint of Collie is about the same footprint as of Cottbus, except the density of Cottbus is 10 times higher. When Collie is less than 10,000, maybe 6 to 8,000 inhabitants, Cottbus is 100,000 on the same area. Other than that, proximity to the mine, here's Beckett, Beckett, and Brandenburg, Collie, sister cities, united. <laughs> And there it is, the, old, the oldest, one of oldest coal uh, generator in the city. Today it's an art gallery, it's not functioning anymore. It's a combined coal generator and water power generator. And that's where we started our journey, where we staged uh, a two-year exercise with the local communities, uh, the church communities, the environmental communities, uh, but also the miners, and the local Serbian or Sorbian indigenous communities, the indigenous of East Germany. A Sorbic culture, more related to Czech and Polish culture than German. Um, there's a four month and eight day intensive exercise with our students and about 15 experts. I call them 33 experts because all the students came from countries of some connection to coal, Botswana, Pakistan, India, our students, masters, students at the University of Liechtenstein, explored the region and its wildlife, and staged these community workshops. Not to talk about jobs so much, or talk about immediate political challenges in the energy domain, but to create with the people visions about what the region could look like in a post coal environment. Uh, we created uh, 10 exhibitions throughout the region in churches, in cinemas, in shopping malls, and created a little book. There's an example on the, the shelf that was very important to us that the cover, as its logo, had the nine cooling towers, which really appealed to the miners. <laughs> And we had a community meeting like this, a bit larger. And on one side were all the miners and button file executives sitting. On the other side, the Greenpeace. We also connected this to the local uh, town of Peitz, it's 5,000 inhabitants. And my hometown in Liechtenstein is also 5,000 inhabitants. Parallels. They have a castle, we have a castle. <laughs> <laughs> We also have a water system. This is the River Rhine in my neighborhood. That's the water system. And these are carp, medieval carp ponds. Um, and the rearing of little carplets occurs in the cooling water of the uh, device behind you. And so we picked four, three, five themes water, landscape, culture industry, and last energy, but not least, because we try to approach this topic of change from these perspectives. Water terribly important because the mine affects the river spray, which provides water and drinking water to Berlin. The sulfate levels are rising, the chemistry of the river is rising, is changing, the groundwater as it comes back, and being re-released in the former mining areas changes the water to acid. So there's a fundamental water challenge in doing whatever we can. So we created visions with the locals of what to do with these mines and how to regenerate the water which is affected using the facilities and the regional resources to rescue the water system. And so this regional tackling of the water regime is terribly important in Germany because it's a very groundwater rich environment and anything you do in any part of the region affects the water regime in the other. And so there is a precedent. It's called Emscher Park in the Ruhr area, which is the old black coal mining and steel manufacturing center. 
50 kilometer long river, which has been in the 90s, from 1990 to the early 2000s, cleaned up. There are 50 coal and steel cities and towns along that river. And it's been an, an incredible success of community-based, government-supported, and private industry partnering transformation of uh, this um, coal and steel oriented economy that was collapsing due to geopolitical shifts, due to market shifts in, in the coal and steel industry, and transforming these environments to new industries, new cultural opportunities, but also jobs in innovation centers, new housing, and new office parks. And these you can visit in this large region of Emscher Park today as a kind of a open air encounter with the possible shift that can take place. One of them is the uh, famous uh, coal and uh, mine, an iron ore mine of Solfein, which has been transformed into a um, museum, into a gallery, into a number of uh, um, opportunities to locate your business there and to um, provide a, a green lung and a community center for the surrounding uh, small and larger communities. There's another example in the United States, the Rivers of Steel program, Southeast Pennsylvania, <coughs> affecting also Pittsburgh. So when coal arrived in the United States and Kentucky and other parts, it engendered uh, a very powerful steel industry. That steel industry went to uh, uh, dramatic changes in the 60s and 70s and, 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 and gave rise to a collapse of the steel industry in, in, in Pennsylvania and other parts of the United States. And the result of that was this program, Rivers of Steel, to try to pull up from the grassroots the local qualities that existed that didn't depend on steel and use them to replace the economic strength that was lost in the steel industry and create new jobs in various kinds of initiatives. Last but not least, of course, tourism around the magnificent uh, cultural relics of the steel uh, industry and using both the miners and the steel factory workers to help in the guiding. Landscape, an important theme. How do we generate and rehabilitate those mining areas into uh, new active and productive landscape areas? Here's a vision of uh, using the sandy soils of Brandenburg to grow hops fields and to allow tourists to come, slightly inebriated by the local bees, <laughs> but safely on their bicycles to explore this former mining area. So these were five themes uh, developed with the local communities to have a positive envision and to kind of embrace the future of these facilities. Uh, including a, a, a bold vision to reforest or to uh, enrich the entire region with a dense forest. In the middle, in the middle ages it was a forested area, but use the forest as a source for both uh, bioenergy, but also for forest-based um, pharmaceutical, forest-based uh, products uh, that derive from the biodiversity engendered by natural and cultivated forests. There's a kind of a precedent too in the UK, Midland, in the Midlands, the National Forest. That's what it looked like 10, 15 years ago. And it's one of the great successes of rehabilitation of black coal mines wow. that have been extraordinary uh, phenomena and there's great pride of not just filling mining pits with water but creating a, a bio reserve of uh, international quality in a very short period of time. This has been also attempted here as a kind of a post mining regeneration effort in our region here. This is the, the mine after the coal has been taken out. 
These are Velex uh, co uh, water uh, filtration towers. Uh, there's an attempt to grow wine. But ultimately, the idea of filling the former mine pits seemed like a wonderful idea in the 60s and 70s when they were thought out as part of the process of mining. You leave behind water-filled mine pits and, 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 and reforestation. The problem is the water is acidic. Yeah. You, you can maybe spend uh, three or four minutes in it. After that, your skin problems disappear along with your skin. <laughs> and it turns out that um, because of the sandy subsoil, the edges are highly unstable. So if you don't keep maintaining this and just leave it like this, in 20 or 30 years it will be just a, a swampy, sandy, leveled area. The groundwater is rising. With the rise, it filters back through the soil. The cultural is, uh, sort of embrace of strategies is also very important. Germany is, as you know, you know been um, host to now more than a million migrants. And many of our participants and students dealt, try to deal with how could we accommodate 100,000 migrants in this region. And so they looked at the uh, urban pattern, the village pattern in the area, and they're trying to figure out strategies where they can accommodate small groups and families of migrants in each of these communities, not in a single new town, but to work with individual villages and communities to accommodate new migrants, new housing visions, but ultimately also to embrace a way in which this former coal generator, coal power generator, can become a community park. Some went overboard and thought it could be a kind of an entertainment park. And there are precedents for that, for this entertainment park, like the um, famous Soweto um, cooling towers. Have you been there? Has anyone bungee jumped off the towers? <laughs> <laughs> South Africa, out of 20 meter high towers. Exciting, exciting. <laughs> Or what traditional cultural power stations that some came up with would said, well, we can actually make this a center of not just museums and galleries, but of the media industry, film production, and so on. And to help uh, explore the region from the space. There is a precedent like that. The Lowell National Cultural Park in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, near Boston, <coughs> uh, location one of the greatest, greatest uh, coal-fired textile uh, areas in the world, before textile um, industry uh, underwent great technological changes and also shifts in <coughs> where the textile were manufactured. And so it's been transformed into a cultural park which became kind of a location for new industries, innovational centers, university outposts for research labs, but also ways of explaining to people what it was like in those days to make textiles, make it from coal-fired local generation, and to use it as a kind of a natural heritage. And it's a, one of the great beloved successes of the early part of the culturally driven development phase of post-industrial United States in the 1980s. In Beijing, you find a similar phenomenon, the Shanxi 798 Art District. Anyone been there? A former uh, heavy industry and tank factory has become to one of the great sort of inhabited by um, uh, artisans' communities, <coughs> art communities at the outskirts of Beijing, um, where the relics of the manufacturing period of the Mao period and uh, post Mao period has become a kind of a uh, embraced location, inhabitational resource for Chinese artists. Industry has been a popular theme with us. What industrial complexes can be engendered? And obviously, energy comes to mind. Energy as being the th common theme that uh, 
the old industries are not really about coal, they're about energy. And if we try to find ways in which we can use those facilities for new energy production, uh, for energy research, for energy related um, facilities, um, bioenergy locational opportunities, uh, but also bringing together a kind of a European innovational center for e-mobility, mind you all, mind, mind all necessarily supported by some government structure and some collaboration between industry and government. Uh, could be an exciting prospect. The facilities are there, this land is there, the railroad access is there, the power is there. It is a natural place for transformation. And there, I can proudly say, as a Liechtenstein derived person, um, there's a wonderful example like that the Brandenburg glass manufacturing. This area is rich in sandy soils, and the Middle Ages was a glass production area. In Liechtenstein, is a, one of Europe's largest traders in solar glass, who've decided to buy a former East German factory and turn it into a solar glass factory here in Brandenburg, using the local resources of sand to make 40% of the European solar glass market, employing 400 people from the local communities. So it's a natural shift in the entire perspective of what this community offers, this region offers in employment opportunities, just by looking at one aspect of the value chain of going solar, is producing the specialized glass required to maximize solar incidence and transmission to reach the um, solar cells. What is required is uh, what we know very well from many examples, a regional strategy, a, a, a collaborative strategy of industries, of uh, universities, of government, to focus on a regional shift of the kind that the greater region of Bilbao underwent. From a very difficult time of factious, high unemployment crisis to one of the most successful manufacturing and innovational corridors in the world, at the very end of which, at the very end of which, lay the sort of visual, a visible transformation of Bilbao as a way of symbolizing this achieved change, including the Guggenheim Museum. Guggenheim Museum didn't lead that change. It was an outcome, a result of the newly found pride in the region to be expressed and be afforded in this institution. And last of these energy, well, it's a natural thing to think of this as places an energy park. We can envision all kinds of new energy opportunities. But there are also lots of land there, lots of open space to place solar fields, if you will, or experiment with bioenergy resources of algae farms and so forth. But also to think of uh, making that bridge between bioenergy to biotechnology, advanced technology that is taking place throughout Europe, and particularly in Germany, in the laboratories of the uh, uh, biotechnology industry that is focused on high yield energy outcomes. A wonderful example uh, I'd like to present you, which uh, is uh, historical, this is the town of Güssing, 5,000 5, uh, inhabitants at the Hungarian border in Austria. A very impoverished, bankrupt community. 25 years ago, the mayor, according to his own story, may not be slightly, slightly uh, be exaggerated, but he said he, will, he was about to commit suicide, he climbed on the hill. He was about to jump into the depth of the town in front of him, and he realized he was surrounded by a sea of green. And he said, what if we disconnected ourselves from the uh, grid, from the petroleum requirement, from the diesel industry 25 years ago, and became energy autonomous? And so this town of Güssing is the first truly energy autonomous community, starting with bio, bioenergy, making partnerships with various industries, making partnerships with university innovation labs, are producing not only um, their own energy, but also the possibility 
of producing renewable energy technology, solar panels and wind blades with renewable energy. So this whole argument, how much fossil fuel is in that panel? It takes 20 years to get rid of that fossil fuel, but it's moot to this action by this one town and this one mayor of Gusen. Extraordinary success story. And there's another success story of a large region of Navarre. Uh, this is an uh, older mining area in the region that decided to look at their 19th century water power infrastructure and use it as a way of storing wind power that was made possible by the Spanish feed-in tariffs in the early 2000s. Uh, then began to invest in bioenergy but also in the solar fields on marginal agricultural land. And they were in the early 2000s the first region and the first company, then Anacciona Energia, then the Anacciona Construction Company, innovated in marketing these solar fields as financial product. This was the first time that occurred. And so these financial products were investment opportunities for retirement, among other things, uh, yielding a secure bond like return. Now, you can easily imagine them to be attached to storage and to ways in which they actually become source for the grid. And indeed, that's what's happening with Actiona today. It's a global player in renewable energy. They, they have um, uh, <coughs> concentrated solar power, parabolic mirror, mirror fields, uh, combined with uh, thermal and electric storage, provide standalone grid balancing resources that cut in when rooftop solar, for instance, goes down. It can be configured in these parable mirror fields or in the concentrated arrays, the solar towers, which are perfectly conceived for Australia. In fact, a, a competing Spanish company had designed one for Australia, but due to changes in the Spanish energy market, that company had to withdraw from the Australian market. But it, the, the technology is perfectly uh, designed for this opportunity. Now, how are we doing in time? Um, you have 10 minutes. Perfect. <laughs> We've got nine minutes left. You could ask yourself, will we make this, uh, getting rid of the, the coal bubble here, getting rid of the natural gas and the petroleum bubble, and can we, while we're at it, also get rid of the tiny little bit of yes. uranium? <laughs> nuclear and power this up. Well, yes we can. The most, most active locations in the United States, um, uh, East uh, Asia, here in Australia uh, and in Europe, we could replace or substitute um, all the other commercial electricity supply five to eight times over. This is known for 10 years. It's been known uh, so there is <laughs> no shortage there, and we see a dramatic change. We have a 20-fold increase in 10 years in uh, installed capacity in wind. We got an almost 55-fold increase in solar PV in the same time period. We got a massive, albeit fluctuating, rise in global investment in renewables, outstripping the combined investment in new fossil and and and. and atomic uh, generation capacity. We got a shift from the old style national supply system. This is the Swiss national energy supply system. Primary energy in on the left, 60% fossil, 25% to 24% nuclear, only 10% water. That's primary energy being converted. A lot of uh, energy loss in the system and then distributed to the far energy users to um, the new system that everyone is embracing and trying to figure out how to best embrace in this autonomous, local, regional, uh, national and continental systems based on the locally available renewable energy sources. A relatively smart but basically commonsensical grid, storage facilities, and a presumer, a production and consuming interaction with industry, with households, uh, with users, with mobility. 
There's a bit of an experiment running in Germany for the last 10 years, and it's a virtual power plant. It's essentially 25 to 30 distributed locations of solar, wind, biogas, and storage switched together and run as a collective provider of electricity, uh, simulating a 500 megawatt coal-fired power plant. So for those that argue for baseload power, it, it's not really an issue. I mean, you don't really need baseload power in a renewable energy paradigm, but if you want it, you can achieve Add to this the explosion of storage technologies from very small, short-term um, electric storage to very large systems uh, of both thermal and electric systems that are uh, making rapid headway. And the whole idea that uh, particularly Germany has fallen in love with the idea of being able to interchange uh, electricity and, and heat and thermal systems through mobility systems, through CHP systems, through transport in general, and to be able to have a, a combined heat and, and, and power renewable energy system that's national and uh, grid-based. And so this idea of individual communities being uh, energy autonomous is not far-fetched. In fact, it's become a mainstream paradigm. Almost 60% of Germany's regions and towns have set themselves the target of becoming 100% renewable energy based. Some have achieved it already. And it's not a target that is so much climate or renewable energy target based. It's a target that's financial. Because of the realization that the production and planning, servicing and operation of Renewable energy provision in local communities translates into a value-added chain which provides profits for companies, local taxes, uh, both income tax and corporate tax, and the net income to the employment, uh, the employees involved in this local provision of community-based energy. And that translates in 2011 to almost 9 billion euros projected to be over 13 billion euros in income, not national income, but income in local communities that wasn't there before, just by the shift to renewable energies. Burgenland did a 100% shift in 10 years by putting up a bunch of sticks with voters at the end. <laughs> and people say, oh, that's ugly, that's ugly. But uh, the answer is, well, we can take him away. We just yeah. take off four screws and put them in the barn. And you have the old landscape. Just put up one nuclear power station if you're happy, happier with that. <laughs> you can do other things with your land. You can add to the global value chain of a revolution in transport systems. And you can do what a lot of uh, cities are doing, which is investing heavily in renewable energy, both locally, regionally, and internationally, to add to their own climate neutrality. And there's a whole wonderful story of communities that have been doing it for 25, 35 years throughout the world. The stories of these communities is for another evening, another night, because I don't want to distract you any further from the second presentation we have. Um, but just to remark that the transformation of the built environment, this is the German government center of Berlin, which is energy autonomous. Who didn't know that? It is energy autonomous. In fact, it, it is using the national grid as a backup system. Uh, very few people, in Germany, very few people know that. It was one of the major first gestures made by the new government as it were. If you're going to have a new government, at least it's going to have to be energy independent. But what it really means that is that we have a different way of looking at cities. We're now looking at cities as potential sources of solar energy. This is a solar energy potential map, but also really a kind of a planning framework for optimizing certain kinds of built environments and their potential, not just to generate solar energy, but to use that solar energy to replace, to supply their own need. Now we've taken this idea, we've taken this idea to look at all forms of 
renewable energy, photovoltaics, wind power, hydro power, and so forth. Um, special options, certain biomass, and we looked at the local municipal areas in that way, and we began to divide them into energy specific characteristic areas that have demand, certain demand profiles, that have certainly efficiency improvement profile, that have certainly uh, certain possibilities of creating or generating or producing uh, thermal energy and electricity. And we looked at our region as 115,000 square kilometers, 4 million people. There's Liechtenstein here, the giant country. <laughs> um, Switzerland, East Switzerland, Southern Germany, and uh, Western um, Austria. And we sort of modeled uh, what in 2050 its autonomy degree is, the degree to which it can produce its own thermal energy. So if you don't do anything special, just the best practice we have now, it's roughly 20%. If you try a little harder, we can get up to 40% thermal energy supply. In power, we can get up from, let's say, 60 to 75% to more than 100% of electric electricity supply locally. In fact, so much so that we can, by 2030, through efficiency improvements and the ramping up of renewables, supply our own uh, power. One minute left. Um, don't worry, I've timed my battery so it actually cuts out. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a surplus. You can say, okay, well, we're going to turn the solar panels off. Let us say we're you know, turn the nuclear power plants off. But no, we can store this. We can convert it to heat. We can store it in methane or hydrogen and so forth. We can use it for other purpose. We can use it for heat. In fact, we can use that to reach 100% thermal requirement. We can even power the entire car fleet if it was electric by 2050 with that surplus electricity. And if you do the final important thing, which is the revolutionized agriculture, build a more biochar, humus enrichment, um, do what you need to do to bed wetlands, to forests, to rivers and waterways, we can sequester carbon, CO2, in our region, become a CO2 negative region, sequestering, beginning to absorb that massive bubble of excess CO2 in the atmosphere. It has to happen all at the same time. It's not such a difficult thing. In fact, the investment, this is Swiss francs, this would be about 300 Australian dollars per year. Roughly one lunch here in the local Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> As I found out. Yeah. Uh, but the important is the cumulative differential cost. I read a lot about how much is that going to cost us? can't afford it. Bill Shorten saying, mm, I don't know, maybe it's going to cost more. But if we don't do anything, then it's going to cost even more. But the point is, it's a differential cost that matters. We have to compare what we have to spend anyway on the existing plant to what it will cost to build a new plant. And here's the differential. There's a little differential here. The green is actually the external cost. It's the environmental cost and improvements. And you see already in 2030, it starts to kick over, and then from 2031, you begin to have a massive negative cost, meaning income or savings, which uh, amount to some 10 billion euros in the 2040 to 2050 time frame in this region alone. So if you don't do that, that's what you add cost to. It's crazy not to do. I can translate into electricity prices. What do you do with that to those? Uh, and jobs created. Uh, that's what it comes down to, how to replace those jobs. And by the way, I've heard it's a thousand jobs in, in Collie. It's 8,000 jobs in Brandenburg, sounds like a lot. But this was 180,000 jobs 10 years ago. They already lost all the jobs. There's still psychology and culture and what we used to means holding on to that not letting go, because 
it is difficult to let go unless you open yourself to the new opportunities that this kind of revolution offers. And I hope we have contributed a little bit to the discussion. In this yeah. Great to see you all here today. And after the inspiring visions of how it could be, <laughs> let's go for it. There's just no reason why not. I'd like to acknowledge Len Bunn and Angus King. I don't think you are here tonight, but they were the co-developers of Siren. It's been a pro bono effort. That's pretty amazing that we had to do it with cake stores, etc. And uh, Sen presents. I mean, why haven't governments done it and promoted it? Why haven't they funded the unis to do it? Well, it's because it's all been uh, held under, isn't it? Governments would like us not to know. Our electricity generation now is 1960s Holden, basically. And I don't know about you, but I got rid of mine, one of those, uh, a long time ago. In fact, Dad had one. He sold it in, in the 70s, I think. Um, our power stations, there they are, but they're up to 51 years old. And basically, we could get rid of all those um, to the collie there. Uh, that, that'll be 29 years of age in 2019, they could all be gone by in this next term of, term of government. And, and that could be replaced with uh, wind and solar. Now we've modelled it and we know it will give a reliable system and a clean system. And when you see the figures, you will be amazed as I was. I couldn't believe the figures myself when I put them through our model. Um, people want it, basically. There's uh, the Australian, the propaganda rag for the right. There's their poll. It reckons 45% more than who don't would be willing to pay $100 more for energy if it was clean. Now, how much do you reckon it'll cost in the Swiss? Any guesses for clean, clean energy to get rid of coal? Anyway, we'll see. <laughs> WA's aged coal stations, they're due for replacement, replacing them all. Um, we would retain the existing gas, that's fine for backing up coal. You might put in a few more fast response gas tur uh, turbines. Um, and uh, it's, it's much cheaper to do that than to replace with the, the supercritical coal that's Go Mo and Mr Turnbull were talking about when they passed their little uh, show and tell around Parliament, you know, the coal. It's much cheaper than that and it will provide 10,000 new jobs. Uh, in round figures, in an excess of the existing coal and coal mining. So that's about what I have to tell you today, and we'll flesh it out a bit. So we get reduce our carbon emissions by 63%, getting rid of coal. Uh, Mujer ABC could be retired by 2021. Um, and this will only, co only cost less than one cent per kilowatt hour more on your power bill. And that's taking into account everything, including new transmission and everything. Uh, it's feasible to do over 90% reduction in emissions by 2030 by adding some storage and some more um, biofuel gas turbine. Now this, this is because, and I think we can look a lot more bullish with this than Germany, because our resources are twice as good. We have the best wind and solar resources in the world here in this state. So we could get, basically, the new Tesla, you know, for the same cost as a Monaro essence, you know, but no, no exhaust gases, you know, it's clean. So, I mean, why wouldn't we, you know? In fact, it would be less cost than the Monaro. So let's look at it um, a bit more closely. Um, the clean trans transition would look like a, a renewable capacity of about 1,000 megawatts. Uh, uh, going from that, what it is now, 11% of generation to 4,200, 50% of generation. I'm saying in the next five years, that would get rid of 75% of the coal. The newest coal-fired power station you'd leave running a bit longer. Okay, approximately 50% of this, 60, 50 60% needs to be wind because wind does blow at night. But the way solar is coming down in price, you know, it could be around half solar as well with needs a bit more storage. The economic boost is a huge 7.1 billion private investment, a billion in new transmission lines, uh, a, a measly business million for the government to spend. The 7.1 billion would come from private investors. 
wonderful for people and super funds and so on wanting to put in these beautiful rock solid investments that pay a steady rate all their lives. Um, so the government only has to pay a billion, they spend a, one and a half billion on a sports stadium. So I mean, I don't know where the governments are at. Um, so we get emission reduction if we close those old power stations, Muja and Collie, uh, would get 50% reduction, basically 6.2 million tonnes a year, three tonnes ahead, uh, like a million people taking a car off the road. So with Siren, the model that we used, and I can't explain it but, uh, in depth, but basically you can place those, simply place them with your mouse and say how big you want them to be on the map. And then it will uh, deliver using NASA weather data going back 10 years and interrogating the SAM model, which is done by the NREL labs in America, the highest, two of the highest scientific institutions in America. Uh, and it will give you actual generation every hour of the year. And you can go back and you can run those for 10 years if you like, and you can see how much that system will produce. And it shows surpluses sometimes and negatives other times and so on, but you know every hour of that particular year you model what the system is doing. You put coal in there as well, you put gas in there as well and you can compare it all. So we do know these things. It's not like they're claiming, oh, it hasn't been modelled, we don't know. Uh, coal doesn't want to put their models up. There have been several of these models done. The Union of New South Wales has to use a different system of their invention that gives a very similar result for Australia. Uh, it doesn't give a, 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 as cheap a cost as Western Australia because we've got such good wind resources. So wind is coming down below $69 now. We factored that in. Solar's we factored in at 69, but it's been sold in Saudi Arabia for $40. There's one in uh, Solar Farm in Broken Hill. And we have another one coming up in Cunderdon, which I know is below $69, because I know the bloke who's investing in, the, in that. We would get 1,400 new jobs, uh, permanent, 700 more than coal, 8,500 in construction uh, for five year sort of period jobs, cleaner energy as well. There's the jobs all laid out from a um, using factors from a Greenpeace um, study. I thought, oh, Greenpeace, maybe people think it's green tinge. So I got another study by SKM for Australia, which came out with higher figures than that for wind. So I think they're pretty real figures, and it's a lot of jobs. So for Collie, getting onto Collie's jobs, what, how to do the transition for Collie? Well, short term, you've got future options, we could retrain them for a start, come up with a package. What uh, party is doing that? Voluntary redundancy packages? Yes, okay. Wind installation hub, you could construct a thousand megawatts of wind within 100 k's of coal. There's good resources there. You could fabricate uh, the blades and the towers at Kemen and Coley or Bunbury. Uh, the, I know we, we questioned a man who runs a huge fiberglass shipbuilding industry in Henderson who said, I'll take the three of the uh, 9,000 blades. He said, I build ships 80 metres long. You know, a, a turbine blade is nothing for me. So, you know, we, we could do it in WA. So a lot of the manufacturing jobs could be here, even if we didn't actually do the, uh, the generator part, the hub itself. In the longer term, we've got potential for um, biomass and Labor, to their credit, have already pledged $30 million towards that in Collie. And we think maybe SEN's fingerprints could be on it because we've spoken to about five Labor and union people on this, uh, you know, the ministers and union leaders. So um, a, a biomass pellet industry is an obvious one. We can grow oil mallies, the native timber out there like weeds, chop them off every four years, sequester the carbon in the roots and do this for a hundred years to like it. So you've got another crop that would then give diversity for agriculture. Pyrolysis oil production from that, okay, could be for the gas turbines or aviation, and you'd probably need a railway line from Collie to do it. Now those jobs, of those jobs we said, there's 3,000 or more of them in Collie. 419 uh, more than was uh, there before in operation, uh, operation and management. And uh, this huge amount here of, of two and a half thousand there and 400 manufacturing could all be in the Collie Bunbury region. So, I mean, what it's like 
if they don't want it, they're, they're actually passing up a huge opportunity, a huge jobs opportunity. And, no, and the government's talking about the need for innovation and jobs, and they haven't even brought it up. You know, I, can't, I cannot get over politics in this state. How do we do it? But the establishment, and they have control of the media, so the media seems to muzzle it. But we'll, we'll get, we will break through. We're starting to break through now, and we will one way or the other. Coljo Wind Farm's an example of, of um, that's already there, 200 megawatt. It's, they reckoned off 40% uh, capacity factor. It's been near 50%. The wind resource is so good. The farmers love it. They're all getting five to four to eight thousand dollars a turbine. Some of them retired on their farms, yeah. where they, you know, where they would have had to go and live elsewhere. So they will open their arms to it. Who's ever seen the wind turbines? I haven't. I mean, so what are the people who are complaining about the look of them? <laughs> you know, I want to go and sleep, but there's this nonsense that get people um, get fed here. Now the prices I used, those conservative ones there, which as you can probably see are high, these are the ones we reckon, these come from actual power prop that purchase agreement struck in Australia in 2016. And look how they've come down, that was four years ago when we started, when we dreamed about, you know, say, uh, $130 uh, um, uh, phase, uh, cost of, of coal, of, of phase out. Now it's come right down to 102 with these figures here. I can't go, we will present this in more depth at other times. These, this graph is a bit hard to take, uh, but just look at the top bit as being cost, okay? And this is a transition, the stages of getting rid of, of uh, coal turbines until you've got rid of all coal there. It's $102. <coughs> Energy is costing 98 if we leave it as it is, and we assume that it's only going to cost half a billion to refurbish uh, something like 1,500 megawatts of coal when they've already spent 300 or 400,000 on just 240 megawatts and they hardly use it. So, I mean, there you go. This is conservative. The conservative figures I show you give you that red line. That dotted line there is the cost of new coal. So here's the phase out of coal, there's the cost of new coal. And, it's, and that's only $4 more than what they're stuck with now with the old coal. So you can see it's good. This green line happens to, well I can put it in because we're using the same scale there of 100. It's near 100, the, 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 the coal, they both start there. So if we say that's 100% emissions, we've gone down here and, uh, to uh, about 50%. We're, we're getting rid of the, the older stations and 63 with them all gone. And uh, down here we can get to 6% if we go 100% uh, renewable. And that's doable. We have modelled it as doable. It's a little bit more expensive, that's all. So what does that mean? Okay, consumers, only $4 more. $3 a megawatt hour for high, high uh, voltage transition, uh, transmission lines. Okay, I've got to put it in, but it's pittance, you know. Consumers would see, if you add that, that $7, that converts to about 0.7 of a cent per kilowatt hour. So consumers would see their electricity bills rise less than a cent per kilowatt hour. So it's, you know, and what more than half, that, that's $50 a year for the average consumer. $50 a year, we just showed you the graph where more than half of them are happy for $100. So, um, you compare this with the old coal generators, that'll cost them more than two cents a kilowatt hour or more if they replace them. And you're stuck on 84% of emissions, of business as usual emissions, for, it, for another 50 years, if you do that. So Turnbull has got to have rocks in his head to say that. And he's, he's either got to be ill-informed or seriously lying. So um, the abatement cost, I put this in because just as a reality check, getting to, to uh, rid of all coal is $18, and I don't know how many of you know about the cost of carbon, $18 a tonne of carbon abated. That is nearly as cheap as what they've been doing with their U-Butte um, protecting trees or whatever that they're doing at the moment. Uh, even getting to 85% is still $77, quite a cheap price. Then when you want to go above it, they're big increments in cost. So you would probably look, wait for a while and see how technology goes and everything else and what other abatements cost before you went above 85%. But 85% is a no-brainer. They could set the rep for 85% and just go for it. You know, and if everyone knew in the industry it's going to be 85%, the rep would work fine. It's a market. 
the price would go down to nothing and they'd all build, build, build. So there's nothing wrong with the reliability of the grids. I'll click through that. Um, those OCGDs can do the job. There are power um, engineers here on InSEN who can vouch for that and we have three of them, some X, uh, Verve and, and so on. So these little things, cheap as chips, cost a tenth as much of a coal-fired power station. It's like having Piers as Commander Norton Commando sitting in the back, you know. You have your motorbike in the back shed, it's cheap, you don't use it often, but when you want to use it, you rev it up quick and it does the job. You only use it 10% of the time, less. Uh, predictable, the wind is predictable in advance anyway, and it's already been done, so there's not an issue there, and you can turn wind and solar down, no problem, it's quite responsive. There's how the transition would look with the gas getting smaller and smaller and storage coming in. This is what would force it to happen anyway, this duck curve that's happened in, Ca in California, where a whole lot of people are putting solar on because it pays them on, uh, into their, um, their own houses. And so instead of the demand going up in the middle of the day, the load on the grid goes right down. So what have the coal generators got to do? They've got to switch off. Well, they've got to turn right down. That can only go down to 30%. And they don't ramp up and down anywhere near that quick. So that would destroy the coal generator in no time trying to do that sort of thing. They are not appropriate and will have to be phased out anyway by popular demand of people putting in solar. So what we need in Australia is this sort of a plan and in WA particularly, you go for, uh, you, um, you get rid of your coal, uh, you get ramp up your wind and PV and at some point you and you get batteries in, at some point you start building larger scale storage up to 20,000 uh, uh, megawatt hours, you can probably get 8,000 in batteries if you're, sounds like science fiction now, but you could do it. A couple of shiploads of batteries in people's yards, backyards. Um, then you would decide which big storage you wanted, whether you wanted to go with uh, molten salt, which is already of course good in, in uh, Nevada, and in Spain and other places, or we'd want to go with uh, PV battery, pumped hydro, plenty of sites along the ocean, and two good dam sites here in uh, WA. Uh, our, our water supply dams. Heaps of government policies, I won't go into them. I want to focus on these two. We would need to retain control of uh, Western Power, uh, so that the government has control over the, the uh, take up and the, the, uh, the, the change, if you like. Uh, the government needs to own all the gas standby fuel generation. All those gas turbines, government needs to own them. So we don't have this nonsense like in South Australia of them deciding, no, nope, we're going to withhold our power so we can charge you $3,000 a megawatt hour for it. It should never charge, it should never cost more than $250 a megawatt hour. And if they were government owned, that would be the case. So there it is in summary. Um, the cost of capital has never been lower anywhere in the world. I think I'm correct in saying that. Uh, state is in a jobs recession, we know that. 10,000 new jobs, 3,400 3, 4, 3, potentially at Colin Mundry, waiting for them. Why are, they, why are they worried about this? State election, a chance for parties to commit to a just transition. So, I don't know, do you want a question or two? Or what I can, I can. Yeah, we're going to do a panel. panel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh. All right, okay. Well, thank you very much.
And it's really a few large companies, relatively few large companies, and their allies and their governments that hold on to this <coughs> paradigm. And what we have is a suppressed revolution, a problem which is political primarily, political and ethical. It's a crisis of democracy. And what we've seen in a lot of the changes in government recently is an expression of the frustration that you just expressed, except uh, there's a perversion of government going on which absorbs this expression of frustration, then converts it. It's called bait and switch. You bait your voters into a revolutionary response, then you switch that power that's been given to you to protect the existing regime. And so there's a kind of a trans or post democratic situation we have now. So, unless we can recapture a democracy which is founded on the local uh, access to resources, jobs, and the realization of prosperity, peace, and um, health, uh, there will be a, a global cataclysm. And so, what, what we experience is this kind of um, oligarchy of cynics that hold on to short-term power positions. Uh, some of them are not individual choices, some of them are corporate choices that are built into the corporate structures of one of the least democratic organizations that we have in the world, and it's large companies. They have no intrinsic ethical balance or democratic vision. They are essentially battleships running on the depleting fuel of the shareholders, or the notional shareholders. And unless we tackle this, through taking back the control locally, um, we will chase an impossible dream, the dream that our voting really will make a difference. And I will see that every day. That's my view, please. How do we take back the power? Can I uh, just add to it? I um, have just recently written a book about this because the uh, it seemed to me very strange that the nations of the world got together to agree on the Paris Agreement just at the point when it was very clear that greenhouse gases were beginning to go down, that renewable energy was cheaper than anything else. In other words, they didn't really have to spend a lot of money on it because the world was changing already much quicker than many people thought. And the, so the nation states actually didn't do much at all when they got together the Paris Agreement. What is driving the change are cities, the cities of the world, even though these regions are doing something special in, in Europe, m many of them are actually cities with regions around them. But the cities are actually making the choices and are choosing renewables because it's now cheaper. And it's phasing out very much quicker than any of the national modelling, and even more than Ben's modelling, actually. Um, because I think the rooftop solar uh, adoption has been so fast here in Perth. Was there any government program for that? Was there any? No, there was almost nothing. There was no program saying, please buy PVs. There was just, there was a little bit of replay, right? But essentially, the price came down. It's now half what it costs to install in, in America. And yeah, the next we phase... We be so much further along. I mean, the yeah, question is, yeah, yeah. why I'll does the price call at one point? <laughs> I know why they do it. Pure theatre. It yes. means nothing, that stuff. Nothing. Really? No, it's theatre. The reality is the market is winning on that stuff so quickly. The next phase is going to be commercial. The comp businesses are going to put them put PVs on their rooftops because it is so much cheaper to do that than they can get from Western Power and Synergy. So that is going to take off. In the, the, today, the Liberals announced they were going to give forty thousand dollars to businesses to do it, and uh, it's a recognition that that's the next market that's happening. So in my in my view, the the uh, yeah, you, you shouldn't get too depressed about the theatre that's going on in politics. It is mostly just trying to attract votes, but in the end their policies 
are just one step behind what the market's doing, and they're just recognising it. It is a dramatic change we're going through. They can, some really bad governments could really stop it if you wanted to, but mostly the market's going to drive them away. So that's a really good question, and, and, and just we've actually done some polling because the, the original question was saying, well, we're preaching to the converted in this room, but we're actually preaching to the converted in the broader community as well because the polling that we've done shows that 85% of swing voters in marginal cities in the lead up to this election uh, support a renewable energy or think that re renewable energy is the preferred uh, energy option for, for meeting all of Western Australia's energy needs into the future. That's, that's 85 per cent of swing voters. You'd think that that's a huge opportunity for any political party to go after that vote. Uh, 75 per cent of all voters across all voting groups, including uh, conservatives and One Nation, support renewable energy. Less than 10 per cent of them support our energy to come from coal. So this is something that quietly has actually taken over the hearts and minds of people as it's taken over their roofs as well uh, here in Western Australia. Uh, but the, that question about Collie, I think, is the real, is the real challenge. And one of the, the, the things that's holding us back uh, is actually uh, the subsidies, state taxpayer subsidies, that's, that's continuing to go into these coal industries. And now we're starting to go into gas industries. And it's the power of incumbency of these industries. And they will fight pretty hard to keep these subsidies. We don't know exactly how much because it's hard to, uh, to tease the figures out of the budget because a lot of these subsidies are hidden and we've got state-owned generation assets and transfers of finance that are hard to keep track of. But during the term of, of this government, the, the, the last eight years, it's somewhere between half a billion and a billion dollars has been provided in direct subsidies to coal in the Collie region. Uh, three hundred, nearly 300 million uh, directly spent on refurbishing the major coal-fired power station, AMB, which was taken offline by the previous uh, Labor government. Uh, nearly 300 million refurbishing that. It's never been turned on because it's never been needed. We've actually got an oversupply of energy in our grid, and yet we're still subsidising these coal industries to keep them online because the, 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 the political parties don't have any real vision about transition for Collie. And that's a real shame because what we know is that there's a huge opportunity for that region. And you know we just have to start talking about that and talking about the opportunity more, uh, rather than this, this doom and gloom thing where we're going to have lost jobs and everything. That's not the case at all. We're actually going to be a, a really important part of, uh, of that community. And, and the grid already exists there. West Australia's Swiss grid is basically built around Collie. So what better place uh, to put in new renewable energy generation assets? Uh, that's the opportunity that we need to start now talking about and making our political parties much more aware of. Uh, my question to you is that how, so if I understand correctly, um, this is a study, is it something that you uh, implemented yourself with, with people? And how, how do you get that funded? So is it funded by a local city, a local region? But this is something which I cooked up, I mean, uh, four years ago really, and I went around and said, I looked, I made a little recording of mapping what the positions were, <coughs> both in the local communities, in the uh, environmental groups, in the political parties, and in the state government uh, locations. I sent a message around and said, we would like to run a community-wide open process, it would not cost anything for anyone to envision the future of this region. And I was uh, responded to by, a, 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 I guess, a your equivalent in the Brandenburg, eh, which is a, a, a Greens um, dominant but really non-party based environmental alliance. And they said, we'd like to work with you and we'd like to offer our collaboration. And uh, thank you for this offer. And they came up, in fact, with the most specific ideas of using this power plant as a kind of a focus. We then went broader and we looked for other allies, including the Protestant Church or the Evangelical Church, which is um, positioned itself in the region as a, a very uh, strong leader in uh, being a base for dialogue and discourse. We also spoke to groups which are 
uh, newly positioning themselves, also bipartisan groups which try to open up perspectives for the region, perspectives for Lusatia, and several other groups, and we try to work with as many of them as possible, and then really focus our attention on creating locally relevant, it's not across the entire region, but locally relevant in this one or two towns which are mostly affected by the immediate location to the biggest mine and the biggest power plant in the region. And so it's we sort of inserted ourselves in the process of what's going on, but added this, uh, for them, unprecedented element of uh, creating positive visions or tangible ideas, even though they may be utopian but it kind of coalesced a lot of energy around the issues by opening up creative potentials of envisioning, of participating in a vision. And it was really quite uh, a, striking, uh, a striking thing for which we're very grateful. And it's just un ongoing now. We'll have this exhibition in a national church-based um, uh, congregation which takes place in two months from now in Berlin and in Brandenburg. And there will continue to be a story that we hope to be to contribute. So it's not a, a single event, but it's trying to take uh, an opportunity to contribute positively to a dialogue and discourse that there and hopefully leaving behind structure for organization. Because uh, the times are changing, the political realizations are changing, as Peter Newman pointed out, that's very correct, the market is shifting. The political reality is also shifting. And if the base has answers and has already plans developed with their allies, like the environmental groups and other community groups, then the change will take place so much more easily. It will take only one or two shifts in the local and regional power structure to then move to the next step. The answers lie there. It's really that the current <laughs> infrastructure of ideas which may be blocked by an, uh, a lack of seeing the opportunities that lie ahead. There's been some, uh, some ideas around uh, a, a community engagement exercise in Collie and there's been a few attempts to kind of do that but, but none of them have had any resources behind them. Uh, certainly the kinds of community groups and, and allies that are being spoken about there would, would love to participate in a process like that here in Collie. Uh, the next step with this siren modelling is to take uh, this information to Collie and present it to, to the Collie community and start to build a dialogue around that. Uh, but, you know, even that takes time and resources and these guys are volunteers and, you know, so uh, there's a huge opportunity there and there's a huge opportunity for uh, an institute like CUSP at uh, Kern Mini to lead a process like that, a dialogue with Collie, with that community on how to transition because I'm sure there's a lot of really good ideas that people in Collie have as well. They know their community and what's possible down there. Uh, so it, it's a huge opportunity, and it's an opportunity that, that needs some support, really, in terms of resources, uh, and, and it could actually transform that, that whole area. So, yeah, just to say, let's forget about these politicians and all the rubbish that goes on with them. Why not work from just getting on with it underneath, getting as many private investors involved, even people who will be probably willing to move their super funds into something um, I, I believe there's one called Superfund already that... Um, Future Super? Future Super, is it? Yeah, the one that doesn't support the gas and the coal industries. And a lot of people have moved their money to that. So it's something along those lines. I just think there's probably heaps of people with money. Yeah. We just need to get it out there and ask, I would guess. And even if it wasn't, little amounts from lots of people is also going to take the power away from those in, at the moment doing the wrong thing. Coal Guard is uh, owned by two superannuation funds. Um, and uh, I don't know whether many know about Sun Brilliance. It's a hundred megawatt solar farm going out under them. Professor Ray Wills, who's a leading light, he is one of the leading investors, and he has Indian investors. I think it's coming on, going to be constructed next year. And I said, well, sixty-nine dollars. I said to him, uh, is what we model the cost of uh, solar out there, you know, in big scale, commercial. And I thought, oh, well, he won't give me anything on that cost. But he said, well, I can tell you, it's less than that. And the year after, it's going to be a lot less than that. That's another thing. To so it's mind. happening anyway. But the governments are really a problem because they have to get behind it and plan where, where are the distribution lines going to go, where are the precincts going to be for these farms, and how can we bring them online quickly. 
and they've just been they've been uh, skiving on that, you know, running away from it. Labor has been particularly disappointing. They've had an opportunity that they've missed. The Greens, of course, go with it. Yes, they'll, they'll all go with it. No problem with that. Got to fight them off, you know. <laughs> 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 Uh, wave power has got a lot of potential. They, their chief engineer said they're aiming to get the price down to the same as offshore wind. But offshore wind's a lot ex more expensive than onshore wind. And we've got just heaps of places we can put onshore wind. Just plug a turbine here, there, there, there. You know, I mean, it's so easy. And we know they work, we know they're reliable. Whereas uh, wave power is probably more of a niche thing at the moment. It's, there are certain Pacific islands that don't have a lot of wind but they need something you know, to, to, to generate at night. So there are areas like that. And certainly um, the English government's taken it up, given them a big grant, and they're, they're doing the way pub off Cornwall. So we might see something in the way, but it's not going to be a panacea. Now, we at sea are keen on these things, but we've purposely de-emphasised it. Otherwise, you fall <coughs> into the trap into the set by those John Lomborg and all those. Oh, we've got to wait, you know, wave will be the answer. Or geothermal. <laughs> wait a minute, we've got the answer here. We've got PV and we've got, uh, and we've got wind, you know. And, and with those two are fine for, for WA. <coughs> so, yeah. I highly suspect that Collie is a bit way ahead of us here in Fremantle. <coughs> in that they have over 25% of PV on their residences, and in Fremantle, <laughs> I come from Scotland and uh, the UK uh, for six months last year, they, the reason I migrated to this country was because there wasn't enough sun over it. <laughs> and, uh, the UK generated more power from the sun for six months of last year and for ten weeks continuous around the period of June and July uh, than coal. So, if they can do it there, yeah. they can do it yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. The amount of solar panels and or wind turbines that you would need, would that require a certain amount of deforestation or lives in certain areas, especially because it's such a um, like tree oriented area? But, um, and then also with the, um, the jobs um, going on there um, to create the turbines and the photovoltaic um, cells, um, what happens when those turbines are completed and what happens when the, when the solar farms are completed um, to the jobs and the research? Well, first, uh, to do with the deforestation, no. There are heaps of farms, there's lots of, of uh, agricultural area there. Um, that all they did, some really, just bought 169 hectares, some little old tiny block out the back of Cundin and then they're going to put it on there. So no, land is no problem. You don't have to pull down trees at all. For, and silo, you've got lots of rooftops and, also, and, and farms as well. So, and it's good, it helps the farmers, as I showed out, you know, that they get paid rent. Um, the other thing, the other question that was about, um, okay, what happens when? It, well, look, it's an ongoing thing. These things have got a lifetime, maybe 25, 30 years, and the blades, etc., have got to be replaced. Also, um, if we get off the blocks now um, and get this industry established here, and as I said, we're, we're the best equipped. We've got both, we've got the industries already here. We've got the so wind and solar resources that Germany would kill for, no doubt. I mean, it's just so much better, and yet they're doing better than us. Um, so if we got these things going, we could be exporting them to other countries and helping them on. Do you think there'll be um, new businesses starting around recycling like solar panels into the future as well and is that an opportunity for jobs? Has that been, I mean you, you mentioned the manufacturing of the, the glass. Well it's, it's more than manufacturing, it's also the finance, the management, the maintenance, the servicing, uh, the improvement, uh, uh, the creating of new integrated developments that are part of the community development that make uh, this value added uh, energy-based uh, income chain work on the local and regional government. Local, uh, sorry, a regional, I mean, uh, the, the region or the, the, the area around the local government area. If you look at that as being moving from the current energy paradigm to a local, what we call autonomous, self-sufficient paradigm, 
you get all kinds of industries emerging or activities that are necessary to maintain this balance. Besides, you're also saving the ex you foregoing the need to export dollars to import energy. So taking all that together, you can actually get to a point where you don't have to necessarily work anymore. You just sit down, collect your <laughs> income. Um, I, one of the recent meetings we had uh, in my own neighborhood, in my own institute, and, uh, we had uh, mayors invited from the region to talk about their experience with other very much change. There was one mayor from uh, an area which had um, achieved 600% electricity production. In other words, they're producing six times as much as they need, which they're exporting. And I said, what is your biggest problem? He said, well, the biggest problem is to reach 800%, otherwise I won't get re-elected next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's a good